Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. <laughs> I love that Easter proclamation. I think it's uh, absolutely perfect, except for one one thing that it lacks, which is that there's no action. It's all words. And the season of Easter is a time that's noticeably more about actions and less about words. For those of you that have um, read the story of Jesus' passion or heard it on Palm Sunday or on Good Friday, you'll be struck by the fact that there disappears all of the moral teaching uh, and all of the uh, parables and the stories that Jesus so often tells. And instead, they're replaced by often silence on his part, especially during the trial, and actions. Um, Not that Jesus was long-winded normally. He was uh, kind of pithy, but he was a, a storyteller at heart. He was a, a, a preacher. There's um, a line from uh, a Leonard Cohen song that I love. I mean, I love, I love all Leonard Cohen songs, but there's a particularly good one called uh, The Stranger Song. And Cohen writes, like any dealer, he was watching for the card that is so high and wild, he'll never need to deal another. And I often think that, um, that storytellers and preachers, the thing that they're, they're doing is they're, they're looking for the story that's so high and wild they'll need... Never need, to, never need to tell another. Uh, and Jesus was like that. He always uh, wanted to tell just one more in case one more story was the one that caught somebody's heart. But it all changes from the start of Holy Week, right from that entrance on the donkey foretold in prophecy, the Messianic r- ride into the royal city. From then on, the words cease and the actions begin. That ride on Palm Sunday is followed by the overturning of the tables in the temple and the anger and the outrage that goes with that and the washing of feet of his disciples afterwards. And Jesus had tried with words and with parables to tell his disciples that the kingdom of God was not going to be like this world. He told them that the first would be last and the last first. And when they squabbled over places in the kingdom, he said, it's, it's like that among the Gentiles, but it's not going to be like that among you. If you want to be first, you have to be the servant of all. And he told them, and he told them, and he told them. And they just could not understand how the power structures of the world were going to be turned upside down. And it took this act of Jesus, the leader of the disciples, getting down on his knees and washing their feet. And, and Peter is outraged. Do you remember? Peter is outraged. He says, no, you can't. You can't wash me, Lord. That's not that's not your job. That's a servant's job. And after everything he's heard Jesus say, he still can't get it into his head about service and love. Uh, And if that were true, then then I found out over the last week that it's um, just as true. Now, I've been doing quite a lot of uh, school assemblies, Easter assemblies over the last week. And one of the things I do is bring in uh, a bowl and some water and a towel and I wash the feet of some of the children there. And the one thing that the parents and the teachers say to me afterwards is, did, did you really do it? Did you, like, did you actually take their, their shoes off and their socks? Did you actually pour water in and wash their feet? And I did. And they say things like, oh, that was brave of you. <laughs> I, I don't know what they're expecting to find under socks. But it still is kind of startling that the person who I guess they normally see up at the front of the person um, within the, the, the power structure is, is, is willing to do that. Uh, and of course, of course we ought to be. If Christ taught us anything, he taught us about service, about love for our neighbours, and especially about the care for the poor, the care for the last, the least, and the lost. Well, after washing the feet of his disciples, then a meal And I'm sure at that meal they shared the story of the Passover, but how much greater when you've got the real deal in front of you. The Passover for the Israelites, by marking the door frames of their houses with the blood of goats, 
the angel of death passed over the firstborn among them. So they didn't die that night, but they died later on. How different our Passover is, that because of the blood of Jesus, we never die. The angel of death passes over and we inherit eternal life. And then after the meal, prayer, arrest, that near silent trial and the crucifixion. And again, Jesus had tried to tell his disciples three times. He explained to them that if they went to Jerusalem and when they went to Jerusalem, the only way that would end would be in his crucifixion. I remember that first time Peter says to them, uh, no, Lord, that can never happen to you. And he tells them again and again, but they cannot understand. And it takes an act. First, the bread and the wine at the Last Supper and then his body on the cross. And this is the act of our salvation. This is the grace of God. Our salvation is not words and commandments and laws, thank goodness, but it is the man, Jesus Christ, a man, not a manifesto. And our sins are atoned through no strength of our own, not because of any of our good works or our merits or our abilities, but simply by the generosity of God. We don't earn it. It's not equal to our ability. In fact, we are quite, quite unfairly remunerated, just like those workers in the, the story of the vineyard who work only an hour but get the full pay for the day. Uh, it's quite, quite unfair. For our evil, we are repaid with unrelenting good. For Jesus said, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. When he created us in the very beginning with the Father, he did not create us to be prisoners to our sin. And when God saw that we were not capable of helping ourselves, he sent his son to be born among us, to live among us and to die for us. And having ensured our salvation on the cross, God had yet another act to perform. He is not here. When has it ever been such good news that someone that you loved and that you were really searching for and hoping to find was absent? He is not here. He is risen. And what great frustration those women must have felt when they went back to the disciples, those who had been closest to Jesus, listening to all his teachings. And in their misogyny, they called it idle chatter. How furious they must have been. And then how joyful and how vindicated when Christ appeared to the disciples as well and they finally believed. The lesson to take from that, my friends, is not um, don't bother telling other people because if Jesus' disciples didn't believe, then no one will. The lesson to take from that is uh, tell other people and if they don't believe, uh, don't worry, you are in great company with the women, with the only ones who remained loyal to Christ the whole way through. And for those who keep the faith just like those women, the future holds vindication and it holds joy. And this resurrection that we celebrate, it does not remove Christ's death on Good Friday. It's not resuscitation. This is resurrection from the dead to new life. And the resurrected Christ still bears the marks of what it cost on Good Friday, the marks of the nails in his hands and his feet, the spear in his side. And he bears these gladly for my sake and for yours. The cross, that device of death and torture, becomes for us a sign of great victory. The scars on Christ's body, they're not blemishes to be concealed, to be covered up, they are wounds most wonderful. They're the way that God boasts to us of his great love for all humankind. And now I know, my friends, that there is a slight irony in starting a sermon and telling you that it's the acts that matter and not the words, and then giving you 10 minutes of words. Uh, so I pass over the acts 
to you. And I say to you, we are an Easter people, a people of the resurrected Jesus Christ, a people who have passed beyond death, a people for whom death has lost its sting. The shackles have fallen off. Go out and live it. Amen. Amen.